can happen. And it's good to be here with you this week. As uh, was mentioned, I just started preaching in Cookville, Tennessee at the Willow Avenue Congregation. And uh, the church is right off of Interstate 40. And so if you're traveling through 40 and you go or headed toward Nashville and you drive by uh, our exit, you will see our building. In fact, you can see it from the interstate. It's up there on the hill. And so if you're ever looking for a place to stop as you're traveling, we are an hour east of Nashville. And so we would encourage you to stop and worship with us there. I am continuing as the director of the Gospel Broadcasting Network, and we've got a lot of good work going on there. As Wayne mentioned, I would encourage you, if you've got an iPhone or an Android or a tablet, an iPad, download the GBN app. We have overhauled it recently, and it is very impressive, if I do say so myself. We've got a good breakdown of the programs, uh, the latest, greatest material. A lot of people are using it for evangelism. One fellow I know who's very evangelistic goes into coffee shops and he sits and studies his Bible. When he meets people, he'll talk to them about the Bible and he'll say, have you seen this GBN app? You should download it on your phone. And uh, he will direct them to that. And we are uh, baptizing a lot of people from the social media that we're doing on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. And so if you want to know more about that work or support the work, GBN does not sell anything. We exist solely because of uh, the free will offerings of members of the Lord's Church. And I'll tell you some more about that as the week goes on. You may have heard that the Methodist Church has been having big issues, big problems over what I have entitled the devil's new favorite sin. And you might be thinking, what in the world is the devil's new favorite sin? Well, it's not a new sin because it's been around a long time. But the issue I'm going to talk about today is homosexuality. Why am I saying it's the devil's new favorite sin? Because in the last few years, it has just burst forth in our society 2015, it was legalized by the Supreme Court. We now see it all around us. It is accepted in many places. The uh, acceptance in society as a whole has just skyrocketed. I'm going to give you some figures about that in just a few minutes. It's dividing people. It's dividing churches. Even though the Methodist church is not the church of the New Testament, they are splitting currently over the issue of homosexuality. You can't turn on the television without seeing every single new show has a homosexual storyline and a homosexual uh, character. You can't even watch commercials anymore. Have you noticed that? That the commercials even are filled with homosexuality. I went on one of the doctor's, uh, the hospital websites to pay my bill recently. I have a lot of doctor's bills these days. I went on to uh, pay it and I noticed across the bottom, they just have their standard picture at the bottom. They've got two men sitting together, two homosexuals. Even on the hospital website, they are touting it. It is very much in vogue in uh, these days to be supportive of homosexuality. That's why I have entitled it, The Devil's New Favorite Sin. The United Methodist Church got to the point that they were so divided on this that they had to have a vote on this issue. They were trying to decide what their stance was going to be. They have traditionally opposed homosexuality. So they were trying to decide, are we going to continue to oppose it or are we going to embrace it? And what are we going to do about the idea of gay clergy? That is, can we have gay priests in the Methodist Church or can we not? PewResearch.org ran an article in February of 2019, two years ago. They were discussing the fact, this is when this was really heating up, that it had gotten so intense that it forced this vote. And so they had the vote in 2019. They decided they were going to continue opposing it. I was impressed and surprised, but it was about a 50-50 vote. Because of this, they expected that the United Methodist Church was going to split over this issue because about half of them said they support same-sex marriage. In fact, the 2014 Pew Research poll said that 60% of United Methodists said that homosexual marriage should be accepted by society. I would expect that if you polled them in 2021, it would be even higher than that. 
They were about to split in 2019. COVID put everything on hold, but I read just last week that the United Methodist Church is splitting and they are forming a new church called the Global Methodist Church. They're splitting over the issue of homosexuality. Let me tell you what else is relevant in the news. I found an article from Breitbart.com. The title of the article was Philadelphia Archbishop. This is the Catholic Church. He says predatory homosexuality is the cause of the abuse crisis in the Catholic Church. What's he talking about? If you watch the news in the last 10, even 20 years, there have been many cases of pedophilia in the Catholic Church. Why is that? This archbishop says it's because of homosexuality in the Catholic Church and many of the bishops and priests are angry because the Pope won't admit it. The Pope will not admit that the problem is homosexuality in the Catholic Church. And so there's a division rising in the Catholic Church over this. Here's another news story. This is from religionnews.com. The title of the article is Notable Christians Who've Had a Change of Heart on the LGBT Issue. And it goes on to list a number of people, all denominational people, who in the last few years have changed their view. That is, traditionally they opposed homosexuality and transgender, but now they're okay with it because they say that they have run across some, quote, new information that has changed their view. I don't know where they've gotten this new information because the Bible hasn't changed. Here's another article. I'm just showing you what society says about this before we delve into the Bible. This article actually was from uh, March of 2019, two years ago. The San Antonio, that is San Antonio, Texas, their city council voted that they were going to kick Chick-fil-A out of the airport in San Antonio. Why would you kick Chick-fil-A? Everybody loves Chick-fil-A, right? You want to take a guess why they kicked Chick-fil-A out of their airport? because of the opposition to homosexuality. They said, if you don't love homosexuality, you can't be a restaurant in our airport. Brethren, I could go on and on and on with similar articles like this. The point is, we are being bombarded on a daily basis with this issue. That's why I called it the devil's new favorite sin. Young people are being brainwashed about this. Older people are being bullied. They're being abused. They are being boycotted in their companies if they do not support homosexuality. Is it working? Is this bullying, this pushing, is it working? Let me share this with you. Pew Research in 2001 polled America. How do you feel about same-sex marriage? 35% of Americans supported same-sex marriage in 2001. That was 20 years ago. In 2017, it was 62%. Is it working? It doubled in 16 years. I don't have the stat for 2021. Do you think the number would be higher? in 2021 since 2017, I'd venture to say it has certainly increased. Has the Lord's church been unaffected by this? I'm going to share some more information with you in tonight's sermon, but let me share this right now. In October 2018, Lipscomb University ran an article in the school newspaper entitled, Students Celebrate National Coming Out Day. Here's how the article from the school newspaper ran. In recognition of National Coming Out Day, Lipscomb University's LGBTQ+, that is in case we missed anybody, the students painted the bison, that's their school, ma their school mascot, painted the bison rainbow colors. They stood around it from early morning until evening on Thursday in support of LGBT the community on campus. Throughout the day, donuts were handed out, faces were painted, and conversations took place. This is in a Brotherhood University. Where am I going with all this? The point that I'm making is simply this. Brethren, Christians, members of the Lord's Church, have got to be talking about this. We've got to be teaching on this subject. We don't like it. We don't like to talk about this. It's an ugly subject. It's an unpleasant subject. 
But we've got to be teaching on this. We have to strongly and regularly be teaching our young people how to answer the arguments that are being made. And so what I'm going to do for the next several minutes is this. And several years ago, in fact, in 2015, when the Supreme Court made this legal in our country, since that time, I have started in every gospel meeting trying to teach this lesson. And you're going to see why in just a minute. What I have done is I have collected arguments that people are making in defense of homosexuality. Most of these arguments I have pulled off of Facebook and social media, and most of these arguments are ones that were made by friends of mine on Facebook who are members of the Lord's church. Now, that's shocking to me. Members of the church who are defending homosexuality. I'm going to go through as many arguments this morning as I have time. We're going to read the arguments and then we're going to discuss them. Some of them are shallow. You can answer them easily. Some of them make you scratch your head a little bit and you've got to think about this, but we've got to know how to answer these things. Several years ago, there was a written debate that was done by Brother Thomas Eves. Brother Eves used to teach at the East Tennessee School of Preaching. He's deceased now. He debated a homosexual preacher from a homosexual church. There are such things as that. What this homosexual preacher did was he took every verse in the Bible that relates to homosexuality and he put a spin on it to make it mean something else because he said this doesn't really oppose homosexuality. We are misinterpreting this. So you look at Sodom and Gomorrah. He said that wasn't homosexuality the Bible was opposing. That was rape that was being opposed. See, these men were trying to force themselves. And he does something similar with every verse. They put this in written form and they put it in a book which they published. It is now out of print, but at the Gospel Broadcasting Network, we have that book available as a digital PDF, which if you want a copy of it, we will email you for free. All you've got to do is write your email address down and give it to me and we will send it to you. And you can read this debate and it will help you understand the arguments and how to answer them because we've got to in this world in which we live. Let me go through some of these arguments. I probably don't have enough time to go through all of them because we've got about 30 minutes, but let's uh, hit several of them. Number one, one argument that people have been making is this. They have said, well, homosexuals have a right to be married. Now, the person who made this argument said, I'm not in favor of it, but that's their right. You know, we live in America, that is their right. But here's the problem. They're not married. On, in June the 28th of 2015, the Supreme Court of the United States said, if they want to be married, they can, and they will legally be married. But here's the thing. They're not married. They weren't married on June the 27th, and they weren't married on June the 28th. And the reason that I say that is Matthew 19 and verse 6, the Bible says, What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, I learn a lot of things from this passage, one of which is God is the one who marries people. God is the one who does the joining. And God will not join people except in accordance with with his will. God will not join two men together. God will not join two women together. And so if God doesn't join you, you are not married. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court or the state of Tennessee or any other state says. You've got a piece of paper that says that you're married, but you are not married. That's one argument I've heard. Here's a second one. I have heard this, this argument made many times since the Supreme Court's ruling, but the argument says all sins are the same. No one sin is worse than another sin, and so I don't know why we are getting so worked up on this issue. Brethren, I've heard this a lot lately. All sins are the same. God views all sins the same. First, I'm not sure where this argument comes from because there is no verse in the Bible that says all sins are the same. I, I guess I know why brethren say it. They say it because any sin can cause a man to be lost. And it's true that any sin is a violation of the will of God, but it is not true that God views all sins the same. In fact, I guess I've heard that for years. Brethren say all sins are the same in the eyes of God. It's not true. And I want to show you this. First, I want to show you that Jesus himself says the opposite of this. 
In John chapter 19 and verse 11, when Jesus is standing in the presence of Pilate, there's an interesting conversation that takes place. Jesus says to Pilate, you could have no power at all against me except it had been given to you from above. Now listen what he says. He says, therefore, the one who has delivered me unto you, he is guilty of the greater sin. Now, I want you to consider that. Jesus says that some sins are greater than other sins. We could stop right there and Jesus has settled the question of whether God views all sins the same because he says some sins in the eyes of God are greater than other sins. Some sins are lesser sins. If we said nothing more about the topic, that settles the matter. But let's keep going. How about this? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, But evil men and impostors grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. If all sins are equal, how could a person grow worse? There would be no worse. Everything would be the same. There would be one constant level, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there is lesser and there is worse. How about this? Psalm 19. The Bible discusses in the King James what is called secret and presumptuous sins. The language of the King James is a little bit confusing, but what secret sins means and should be translated are sins of ignorance. Presumptuous sins are sins of full knowledge. That is, sometimes I commit sins and I don't know it. It's secret. It's secret to me. I didn't know it was a sin. A presumptuous sin is I was very presumptuous. I knew it was wrong and I shook my fist in the face of God and did it anyway. When the Bible talks about sins of ignorance versus sins of full knowledge in Psalm 19 and verse 13, when it mentions the sin of presumption, that is a sin of full knowledge, it calls it the great transgression. Now, what's the meaning of that? It doesn't mean that a sin of ignorance is not a sin, but it means if you knew good and well it was a sin and you did it anyway, God views that more seriously. What's the point? He doesn't view those two things the same. A sin of ignorance is a sin. A sin of full knowledge is more serious. How about this? Proverbs 6 and verse 16, the Bible says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. And so what you have here is kind of a top ten, top seven actually, top seven list of things that are the most offensive to God. If all sins are the same, then I don't even know what that, that list means. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible says if a man won't provide for his own, he's denied the faith. And what's the Bible say? He's the same as an infidel, right? No, it says he's worse than an infidel. How can you be worse if God views all sins the same? How about this? Exodus chapter 32 and verse 20. Moses has been up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. When he comes down from the mountain, do you remember what he found? What was going on at the base of the mountain? Idol worship. What were they worshiping? The golden calf. They're engaging in immorality. They are worshiping the golden calf. Exodus 32 and verse 21, when Moses sees it, he says to Aaron, how have you brought so great a sin upon the people? That is, he said, Aaron, this is serious. This is a high level sin. That is, you're looking at an idol and saying that it's God, this is serious, serious, Aaron. How about this? 1 Samuel chapter 2, 22 through 24. The Bible says that some sins are against man, some sins are against God. One is more serious than the other, but they're not the same. God doesn't view sins the same. 1 John 5 and verse 16 says, there's a sin unto death, there's a sin not unto death. Now, we're not going to talk about what that means right now, except to say... They're different types of sin. God doesn't view them the same. 2 Peter 2 and verse 20 tells us about a Christian, a man who obeys the gospel, becomes a child of God. He leaves sin and he goes back into it. The Bible says the latter end is worse with him than the beginning. It would have been better for him not to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto him. And then he compares it to a, a sow that was washed returning to the mire. Now what's the point? Why is the latter end worse? Why does God punish one more severely than the other? If all sin is the same, why is one going to be more severe? Friends, I could go on and on and on and list hundreds of verses that teach not all sin is the same in the eyes of God. Not to be belittling, but who would believe 
that God would look down from heaven and see a man sexually molesting a child and see another man running a red light and saying, those are the same. Is that the same to you? Are those the same to you? You know what? They're not the same to God either. We need to stop saying that all sins are the same because the Bible doesn't teach that. Here's a third thing that brethren have said. Someone said, in fact, a gospel preacher, I saw write an article and he said, I don't know why we are so worked up about same-sex marriage. He said, homosexuality is no worse than adultery or heterosexual fornication. He said, they're both fornication, and fornication is fornication. They're the same. Why do we try to make one seem like it's so much worse? Brethren, I've frequently seen this argument made. It's not a true argument. I want you to see what the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 26, because God does describe homosexuality as different. Now, I'm not saying that uh, the other is wrong. Adultery is an abomination. It is a sin, and we should be condemning it. Heterosexual fornication is wickedness. It destroys homes, and we should be condemning it. But God doesn't view it the same. I want you to look at this. In Romans chapter 1, let's read this. Romans 1 and verse 26. The Bible says, for this cause, this is describing homosexuality. For this cause, God gave them up to, the King James says, vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men working with men that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the just recompense of their reward. Now, I want to pull out a few words that the Lord uses to describe this, some key phrases. First, He describes homosexuality as vile. What does the word vile mean? Vile, the word, the Greek word here, the, the, the English word vile means morally base, wicked, or evil, depraved and, and sinful, offensive to the senses and sensibilities, repulsive and disgusting, cheap, worthless, degrading, lowly, of poor quality, and very inferior. The Greek phrase here, vile affections, comes from a Greek phrase which means passions of dishonor. To have this type of passion is dishonorable, the Bible says. The Lord does not view it the same as a heterosexual fornication. A second description God gives is unseemly. Romans 1 27, the latter part of the verse, men working with men, that which is unseemly. What does that mean? I looked it up in Vine's Expository Dictionary and it said, see also shame. S-H-A-M-E. Don't you hate when you look up a word and it tells you to look up another word? I want to know what the word means. So I looked it up in Perschbacher's Greek lexicon and it said indecency, infamous lust, or lewdness. But particularly pertinent to our discussion right now is this third word it, it, it lists and that is the word unnatural. I want to be tactful here, but I want you to think about the anatomy of a man and the anatomy of a woman and how they naturally go together because God made us that way. Now, in contrast, when a man has relations with another man or a woman has relations with another woman, the Bible says it's unnatural. It is not the same. They are both wicked, but they are not the same. God does not view them the same. We could say more for the sake of time. I'm going to move on. Here's argument number four. Now, this one might surprise you. Some people are saying, some members of the church. In fact, I was sitting in a Bible class and I heard a member of the church make this argument. I about fell out of my seat when I heard it. I have heard people say, the Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality. And so, what would happen is this. Maybe you are talking to a friend about the subject of homosexuality and you point out that it's wrong. And your friend says, why? Why do you think it's wrong? And you say, well, the Bible condemns it. And they say, no, it doesn't. You say, sure, it does. They say, where? And you say, well, Genesis 18 and 19, Sodom and Gomorrah. And they say, that's not why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. You say, of course it is. 
And your friend says, let me show you this, which is what I heard a sister in Christ say in Bible class. She said, Ezekiel 16, 49 says, look, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride and fullness of food and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And so she said, the Bible says the sin of Sodom was pride and the fact that she did not help the poor and the fact that they were lazy. We always say that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because of homosexuality, but the Bible flat out says, look, this was the sin of Sodom. She was proud and lazy. What do you say to that? When she first said this in the class, it kind of stumped me. And I thought, I'm not sure what to say to that. Well, I know what to say to it now because I spent some time looking at this and the answer is actually very obvious. Ezekiel 16, 49 does say, look, this was the sin of Sodom. She was proud, da, 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 da. Look at the next verse though. When you look at verse 50, the Bible says, and, that is the thought is continuing, and they were haughty, and they committed abomination before me, therefore I took them away as I saw fit. You know what these two verses tell us? These two verses tell us there was a transition. They tell us that they didn't embrace homosexuality overnight. They tell us that they started by being prideful. They were just full of themselves. And then they got to the point that they were lazy. They got to the point that they were consumed with themselves. They didn't care about the poor and needy. All they wanted was their comfort. And then they got to the point that they tolerated sin and homosexuality. Eventually they got to the point that they embraced it. And the Lord said, I'd had enough. A society doesn't just wake up one morning and embrace homosexuality. There's a progression. I would ask the question, where are we in the United States? Did we begin where we were prideful and we got to the point that, you know, we were just self-consumed? I'm not talking about the Lord's Church. I mean the nation as a whole. And then we're okay with homosexuality and then we embrace it. I don't know how we couldn't say we haven't embraced it in this country. It's the law of the land now. At what point does the Lord say enough is enough? I think we've got a serious warning here. Why does the Lord say He destroyed them according to this verse? They committed abomination. Now you might say, well, Don, it doesn't say homosexuality. It says abomination. Do you know what homosexuality is referred to as in the Old Testament? Listen to this. This is Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. If a man lies with a man as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination and they shall surely be put to death, and their blood shall be upon them. Could the Lord have made it any clearer that He's talking about homosexuality? If a man lies with a man as he lies with a woman, the Lord is making this very, very clear. He says they have committed abomination. And so what we know is the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. But the argument's being made that the Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality. In fact, the book, the PDF that I mentioned, that's one of the things that they deal with in that book. Here's number five. I've got to move on. I have heard people say this, members of the church, they have said, well, the Bible says judge not. Have you heard that argument? Judge not. I see a lot of heads nodding. They say judge not and yet we're condemning homosexuals. That's not right. This is a total misuse of Matthew 7 and verse 1 where the Bible says, Judge not that you be not judged. Now, how do you answer this? I actually have a whole lesson just on this, so I've got to be quick about how I summarize it. How do you answer this? The first thing that I would say is this. When people say to me, the Bible says, Judge not, I point out to them, John, in John 7 and verse 24 says, Judge not according to appearance but judge ye righteous judgment. And so Matthew 7 says, judge not. John says, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And so John actually com commands us to judge. Matthew tells us not to engage in certain types of judging. Specifically, Matthew is saying, don't be a hypocrite with regard to your judging. 
That is, he says, how can you have, a, if you've got a speck in your eye, or your neighbor has a speck in his eye, and you've got a beam in your own eye, how can you judge your neighbor? Matthew's talking about hypocritical judging. He says there's a certain type of judging you shouldn't engage in. John says there's a certain type of judging you shouldn't engage in. That is, make sure it's not unrighteous judging, judge a righteous judgment. That is, you have to make judgments if you're a Christian. Matthew 7, the judging chapter, starts with Matthew 7 and verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. Then he moves on to Matthew 7, 15 through 19, and he says that you have to look at their fruits. By their fruits you shall know them. What's the point? You've got to look at their fruits and you've got to make a judgment call. You've got to say they're false teachers. In other words, you have to make judgments. And so the Bible forbids hypocritical judging. It forbids unrighteous judging, but it commands that we call sin, sin. Number six. Now I could spend a long time on number six, but many people in the world and some in the church are saying God made them that way. They were born as homosexuals. Have you heard that? Do you think society believes that? That people were born as homosexuals? Where could you go in the Bible to prove that that's not true? I'll give you a couple of verses and then we're going to move on. You could look at the Bible, you could look at science. I'm going to give you a little bit of both. First, I want you to notice a passage that we just cited in Romans chapter 1 and verse 26. Listen how the Bible describes homosexuality. In Romans 1 26, it says the women exchanged the natural use of the women. What does that mean? That doesn't mean they were born that way. He says they exchanged it. There is a conscious choice that is made in verse number 27, Romans 1 27, it says men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. What does that mean? They made a conscious choice to do this. The Bible never states that uh, individuals were born that way. It always uses the language of the choice. Why would it be a choice? Because it is an action that a person engages in. Homosexual relations. What about science? Does science teach that individuals are actually born this way. Absolutely science does not teach this. In fact, there have been at least eight major studies that have been done worldwide in which they took identical twins for this study. Now why would they take identical twins? Identical twins have the same genes. They have the same DNA. And so what that means is if you are born as a homosexual because of your genetics, if one brother or one son is a homosexual because of your DNA, what should be the case with the other? He should be a, a homosexual also. If you're a lesbian because of your DNA, your sister should also be a lesbian. In eight major studies, what they found was when they looked at males, if one of them was a homosexual, the chances that his brother would also be a homosexual, if it is genetics, it should be 100% of the time. What they found in reality was it was 11% of the time. When they looked at lesbians, if it is genetic, it should be 100%. With lesbians, it is 14% of the time. What does that mean? What that means is it is not genetic. About 20 years ago, there was a study or a, um, an international consortium that was done. It was called the Human Genome Project. And what they did was they went through and they mapped all of the DNA in the human body and they said this goes to this and this goes to this and this goes to this. One of the things they were expecting to find and that the liberal media was touting was a gay gene. They thought they were going to find a gene that was responsible for causing people to be homosexuals. When they got through mapping the human genome, what they found was no gay gene. There is no such thing as a gay gene. In fact, there, was, uh, there have been some studies that have been biased, that have been done by homosexuals, that have said that we are born that way. Those studies have been refuted and they have been put down time and time again. Science does not show any evidence whatsoever that we are born as gay 
are born as homosexuals. In fact, I've got a list of some of these studies if a person wants to look at them. In fact, right now on the apologetics website, apologeticspress.org, they go through some of these studies and they talk about them in detail, de dealing with the scientific evidence that we are not born as homosexuals. Let me watch my time. Boy, it's getting away from me in a hurry here. Let me move on to um, the next point. The next point is, let's see, wow, seven minutes. I may have to skip some of those because I really want to hit some of these points. Number seven, sometimes people are saying, well, if homosexuality is such a serious thing, why did Jesus never condemn it? Why did Jesus never say that homosexuality is wrong? Very quickly, Jesus never used the term homosexuality, but this is what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 19, in defining marriage, he said, Have you not read that he that made them in the beginning made them male and female? Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. When Jesus defined marriage, he defined it as being between a male and a female. Sex outside of marriage is sinful. Sex inside of a marriage, Jesus said, must be a male and a female. You could take those facts and lay them out in a logical syllogism and prove that Jesus condemned homosexuality. But you know, besides that, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It all came from the same source, and that is the Holy Spirit. The words Jesus spoke and the other words spoken by the Holy Spirit are from the same source and condemn homosexuality. Number eight, I have heard people say this. Well, homosexuals marrying... That is a civil right. It is equivalent to racial equality. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Is that the five-minute bell? Oh, man. Um, I've heard people say in the 60s and the 70s when I was growing up that the big fight going on in this country was for racial equality. Today, the fight is for sexual equality, and they're the same thing. Brethren, they're not the same thing. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I don't have a lot of time, but I would simply say this. They're not the same thing because homosexuality is a choice. It is a sin. It is an activity. A person's race or his skin color or his nationality is not a choice and it's not sinful. Acts 17 and verse 26 says that God has made of one blood every nation that dwells on the face of the earth. That means that we all come from the same blood. We all come from Adam and Eve. That's why racism is so stupid, because we all come from the same people. We're all brothers and sisters. And 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 6 says, God does not look on the outward appearance as man does, but God looks on the heart. That is, God doesn't care about your height or your skin color. God looks at the heart of man, it is an invalid argument. Here's the next one. I've got to hit this very quickly. It is being said that homosexuals are minding their own business, or homosexuals are not hurting anybody, so why don't you mind your own business? It is not true that homosexuals are not hurting anyone. In fact, if you will look at the statistics, Apologetics Press has an article about this right now, and it deals with the fact that homosexuals, I believe it says, are 8 to 12 times more likely to molest children than are heterosexuals. And they cite the statistics on this. You can look it up if you want to see it. I encourage you to go and to read the article. It is also the case if you consider the Boy Scouts. Just a few years ago, the Boy Scouts legalized homosexuality as far as their particular rules are. They said scoutmasters can now be gay men. It wasn't very long, and so many cases of pedophilia started arising in the Boy Scouts that they ended up filing bankruptcy. The number of sexual abuse cases in the Boy Scouts of America has now exceeded 82,000. When people say... It is not hurting anyone. Mind your own business. Don't believe it. Let me move on to the last point. I'm going to skip some of this because we're running out of time. What is our responsibility in this matter as Christians? Number one, we can't compromise. Brethren, we could sit back and we could say, well, if we say anything about this, we're going to be persecuted. 
If we say anything about this, you know, we're going to be ridiculed. We might lose our tax exempt status. I had one church I was going to go to. I wanted to speak about some things like this. And one of the elders told me, don't do that here. He said, because we might lose our tax exempt status. Are you kidding me? Brethren, we can't be concerned about losing our tax-exempt status. We have got to stand up for what the Bible says. You know, I think about Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. We oftentimes cite that in the plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, be thou faithful unto death. Did you know that that's not really what that verse is talking about? If you read Revelation 2.10, he's talking about the fact that the church there was being persecuted. He was saying, some of you are going to be persecuted. Some of you are going to be put into prison. Some of you are going to be killed for your faith. But he said, but be thou faithful unto death. He doesn't say be faithful until death. He says be faithful unto death. That is even unto the point of dying for your faith. Even unto the point of losing your tax exempt status. Be faithful. We can't compromise. Number two, what's our responsibility? We need to reach out to homosexuals with the gospel. You know, the church is not a country club for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And homosexuals are sinners, just like all the rest of us were sinners. They need to be invited. They need to be welcome to hear the truth. We need to have Bible studies with them. It could be that I find this sin so repulsive that I would not invite such a person to services. If that's the case, then shame on you and shame on me if we so class this sin to think that they're not good enough for the truth. You know what? You weren't good enough for the truth. And I wasn't good enough for the truth. But thank God someone took the time to teach you and me. Number three, what is our responsibility? We need to teach and we need to understand that homosexuals can change. They can change. What are the causes of homosexuality? The, if you will read this particular article I'm talking about, there's three articles on AP's website. They talk about the causes of homosexuality. The number one cause they discuss is almost all individuals who profess homosexuality did not have a good father figure or relationship with their dad in the home. Number two, individuals who profess homosexuality were 8 to 12 times more likely to have been molested, sexually molested, when they were children. Now, what's the point of that? You're not born that way. It is external factors. Individuals can change from homosexuality. How do I know that? Listen to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, the Bible says to the Corinth Church of Christ, do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality shall inherit the kingdom of God. But then verse 10 goes on to say, but such were some of you. But you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. Now what's the point of that? Some of the members of the Corinth Church of Christ used to practice homosexuality, but they stopped and they repented and they obeyed the gospel. Such were some of you. Brethren, if I were going to summarize this lesson, I would say three things. Number one, we serve a judge who is infinitely greater than the Supreme Court of the United States. Number two, our resolve must be infinitely greater than the world around us. And number three, the blood of Jesus Christ is infinitely greater than any sin that man can commit. A person might have been a homosexual, but he can stop that and he can repent of his sins and he can be a faithful child of God. And we should, though it's a sin and we have to keep opposing it, we have to realize these are people, that they have the love of God. Jesus died for them and we need to reach out to them and teach them so that they can be children of God, just like those of us in the Lord's church. All right, I'm going to stop. Thank